We did. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you, Isla. We not only have a quorum, we almost have 100% attendance. I'll tell you, you guys are your magnets. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order as soon as Senator McNally <laughs> called the meeting to order. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. No, it was perfect. It was just like it was orchestrated. I didn't say that. Mayor McBride, you have a special guest today. He's re re reported to be in these parts. They call him the shootest. But could you introduce someone special? Uh, this is my youngest son, Will. He's uh, competing in the state championship on the clay target program for the state this week. He's uh, shot Tuesday skeet yesterday sporting clays and today's trap at one o'clock so he that's fantastic welcome will mcbride thank you for being here good luck today that's was great. he the one with us last time yes sir. good he's grown a lot that's great and looks very confident you're going to have a good day um I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Is there anything that anybody wants to bring up at the outset here before we get to our next report uh, behind tab six? All right. Um, I, think, I think Bill Terry's back on today. Do I remember that correctly, Lanice? Yes, Bill Terry, senior research consultant, tab six. Land use legislation, the final report. And it will require our approval or otherwise. Thank you, good morning. Seems like I've been here before. Yes, sir. Welcome back. Uh, this is the final report of uh, our land use legislation. The draft was originally presented to you in February. Uh, so I'm going to quickly summarize the high spots here and then if there are any questions we can go into more detail. The bills that were sent to TASA for study are listed on the first two pages. I want to go on over and talk about uh, a couple of things. Um, the report is virtually the same as you saw in February with two additions that have been made since that time to address a couple of issues. Uh, they're covered on page eight of the report. Uh, about the third paragraph down. Um, first issue that's been added deals with an uh, item known as concurrency. This is a concept where uh, adequate infrastructure that's required for development must be in place before development can occur. That's called concurrency. And that can be used both to direct development to spaces where it should occur and where infrastructure is available. And it also can prohibit development in areas that would require costly new infrastructure. This particular type concept is available in three states by legislation, Florida, Vermont, and Washington. Uh, they all allow their local governments to adopt concurrency requirements. Um, local governments in other states have adopted those even though they might not have the specific legislation to do so, so it's not all that uh, unusual to, to encounter it. The other issue that we introduced that's new is called performance-based planning. Now this, this type of planning evaluates each proposed development based on a community's quality of life goals, physical characteristics of the land and the capacity of existing infrastructure rather than designating certain areas for certain types of development. The performance standards cover things like traffic flow, density, noise, access to light and air, building design sometimes. Since it allows nearly any building that meets the community's performance standards to be constructed, it also provides great flexibility. That flexibility is difficult to administer, and therefore it's not gained widespread acceptance. Uh, <clears throat> one example of this is the town of Breckenridge, Colorado, which adopted performance-based planning in 1978. However, others that have adopted it have gone back to a hybrid of standard zoning type procedures and um, performance-based planning and zoning. Go back to um, the title of this report. <clears throat> Land use in Tennessee striking a balance. That's, uh, that balance is a key word through this entire report it's because there are competing interests on all sides. Disputes between landowners over how they want to use their property have long been a source of tension. How your neighbors use their property affects your property and your property values. 
for most of our history, people had no recourse except through the courts. And by the early 20th century, they began to look to their elected officials for less costly and more effective ways of resolving land use conflicts. Land use issues continue to play an important role throughout the country and in Tennessee. During the 107th General Assembly, a large number of bills addressing land use issues were considered. Seven of those bills were referred by the House State and Local Government Subcommittee to us for study. These bills focused on four basic topics. What constitutes a subdivision? Who gets to regulate land use outside the city limits in areas set aside for them to annex? Roads built by developers and grandfathering of land uses that don't conform to new zoning requirements. <clears throat> First category to look at briefly is defining subdivisions. The commission was sent two bills that take subdivision regulations in opposite directions. <clears throat> one would regulate more type plots and one would regulate less. The first bill uh, would limit the grant of authority uh, to, in those counties, um, oops, lost my track here. Current law uh, allows but does not require local governments to adopt standards in subdivision regulations, particularly uh, in tracts for five acres or smaller in Tennessee. That's uh, the definition of a subdivision, any lot five acres or smaller, or that requires new road extensions and utilities. All states have some provisions to this, except that most states do not limit the grant of authority to lot sizes. They leave it up to the local governments. <clears throat> One bill that was sent to us would have prevented planning commissions, regional planning commissions, in the 47 counties that do not have zoning to um, uh, from regulating lots one acre or smaller. 48 counties in Tennessee have zoning, 47 counties do not. So this particular bill would address those counties that do not have zoning and would have prohibited the regulation of subdivision for all, for all lots under one acre in size. The other bill would have enabled local governments to regulate the subdivision of lots between five and 25 acres in size. So those are two different purposes involved in those two bills. The, other, the next category is planning and zoning by cities outside their boundaries. Uh, this probably ought to have a little explanation here. <clears throat> Tennessee law has, has long enabled cities to have planning regions outside their corporate boundary. And, in, and uh, they can regulate subdivisions within that region and they could adopt what's known as extraterritorial zoning, subject to certain re restrictions. Uh, current law now allows municipalities in the counties, uh, in those counties, to apply to the Department of Economic and Community Development through the Local Government Planning Advisory Committee, uh, known as LGPAC for the uh, authority to zone and regulate subdivision land in that planning region outside the city limits. But it can only do so if the county's governing body agrees to it. That wrinkle was put in the law by the adoption of Public Chapter 01. As a matter of practice in reviewing requests for planning regions and authority, LGPAC gives counties with zoning and an opportunity to object if a city proposes a, to regulate subdivisions outside the corporate limits and within that uh, planning region boundary. LGPAC retains the authority in counties with zoning to approve a planning region and subdivision authority if they choose to. But municipalities may not zone outside their corporate boundaries in a county that has zoning. <clears throat> One bill that was submitted on this subject would have enabled municipalities and counties without countywide zoning to both zone and regulate land use outside their corporate limits without prior approval of the county legislative body. 
The other bill that was filed would have enabled municipalities in those counties to regulate subdivisions but not zone outside their corporate limits without the approval of the county legislative body. <clears throat> a couple of things to point out in this, uh, is, this issue of regional planning as possible solutions to some of the disagreements that exist is that uh, Tennessee law allows for the creation of joint city-county planning commissions. Four counties in the state have those planning commissions and they've had them for a good while. Knox County and the city of Knoxville has had a joint regional planning commission since 1956. Hamilton County and the municipalities of Chattanooga, East Ridge, Lake Site, Lookout Mountain, Ridgeside, and Walden have since June of 1943. Montgomery County and Clarksville since January of 1963. And Pickett County and Birdstown, a much more rural area, uh, since August of 1976. The other way out of um, resolving issues in these county and city and regional areas is through the Joint Economic and Community Development Boards that are set up for regional cooperation. Mamie Wright and I were discussing this quite a bit before this meeting started. Now another topic, <clears throat> roads built by developers. Two bills were sent to the commission relate to providing standards for roads built by developers. Under current law, all planning commissions are authorized to adopt requirements for subdivision roads. They don't have to, but they are authorized to, and most have. One bill which applied only to roads in the city's planning regions outside of the corporate limits would have required those cities to accept full responsibility for subdivision roads in that region relieves the county of the responsibility of the roads, of the responsibility of inspections, and so they have to follow the city standards. <clears throat> the other bill would have permitted a developer and lot purchasers to agree to a private road agreement, relieving, um, again, the county or the city of any responsibility and putting the responsibility upon the landowners to maintain the streets. A planning commission could not prohibit a subdivision approval simply because the roads are private instead of public. <clears throat> Finally, land uses that do not conform to the, to the current zoning regulations, if the zoning regulations change. <clears throat> a number of bills were introduced in 2012 related to provisions that protect landowners from zoning changes but only one of those bills was sent to Tasha for study. This bill would have removed language from the law that requires local government to prove intentional abandonment or discontinuance of land use that does not comply with current zoning requirements. And this order, in order to prevent the landowner from reestablishing that use, it's a very controversial issue. The bill would have required instead local governments to prove abandonment based upon criteria that were spelled out in the law, such as utility connection information, photographs of the, pro of the property, and indicating that abandonment of a property has occurred. There was another bill which was taken off notice in, in, the, House, in the Senate and not, taken, and not acted upon in the House, which would have completely rewritten that particular section of state law, since known as the grandfather provision. And there's probably a, a large body of opinion that says that section of the code should be rewritten. But there is no consensus on how it should be worded and what should go on there. <clears throat> now those were as a, as a hasty description of the bills. Any questions? Thank you. In the about uh, zoning outside the municipal boundaries is that is that within an air a, a, a defined area that's within the urban growth boundary a part of the yes uh, and, it, and it, it is defined as an area prior, there, to, prior to the creation of urban growth boundaries we had planning regions right. outside of the city limits and these planning regions were were authorized to be created by LGPAC. are there any 
service requirements, plan of service, or anything like that for for that area? It's just it's it's authority to regulate subdivisions and to develop a plan in that uh, region. It's now called the urban growth boundary in most cases. Is the presumption that that area will be is is, is uh, a candidate for annexation? Is that is that uh, yeah? The, issue? the the initial reason for having a for a municipality having a uh, planning region and enforcing its regulations in that region is because of the anticipation that at some point in time that area will be brought into the city and that the development standards in the city and the region will be comparable. Lenise. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll continue then. Uh, one minute. No, Lenise was oh. seeking recognition. Okay. I just wanted to um, point out that in the um, couple of pages that that bill cover there there are some statements that are made some qualitative statements about the legislation let me cover um, those do you want to pick those up yeah okay. I can <clears throat> so I was being too brief <clears throat> under the defining subdivisions section of your report um, was page two, two. <clears throat> there's a statement is made that uh, exempting lots one acre or smaller from regulation based on one of the bills could jeopardize property values by denying property owners benefits such as adequate roads and water as well as assurances that the development of adjacent property uh, would comply with similar standards. Amending it to apply to lots larger, larger than five acres could also extend those benefits to more property owners. Um, under planning and zoning outside the corporate boundary, um, statement is made on page three that support for the bill dealing with uh, regulation of land use and zoning in that region that you were just talking about. Um, comes from city officials with concerns about being responsible through annexation for development that does not meet city standards, as we were talking about. Opposition to the bills stems largely from concerns of residents living outside the cities and in that region about land use regulations being imposed upon them by government officials for whom they cannot vote. <clears throat> and the, under the topic of roads built by developers, statement we make there is that it is unclear in this bill exempting whether a planning commission would be able to require such roads to meet construction standards for subdivision roads. Concern being here that uh, uh, eventually they might become a public responsibility. But the concern about introduction of the bill of this bill is that the cost to build roads to municipal or to county standards is outweighed by the benefits of both increased safety, improved construction of those roads, and long, lower long-term maintenance costs. That's if, the if road standards are applied. <clears throat> Under the topic of non-conforming uses, the grandfather clause, uh, we make the statement that <clears throat> substituting specific criteria for the determination of whether when an abandonment has occurred could benefit local government in making that determination and it would also clarify for landowners exactly what constitutes an abandonment so, so that if a business goes out that it is uh, easier to determine whether or not that business has been abandoned. <clears throat> yeah, that's the gist of it. Mm -hmm. One more issue that I think is important to discuss. Okay is, uh, and it gets into this dispute issue between landowners. And disputes over land use planning and regulation is evidenced by the large number of bills that were introduced in 2012 to address various aspects of the enabling Act to restrict the authority granted by local government. The time these bills were introduced to expand local government planning authority, so you had competing bills in that issue. You had some that would restrict local government planning authority. You had some that would expand it. 
And before acting on these, uh, the members of the legislature chose to send them to Tasser for this study. Um, at one time in this country, land use conflicts between neighbors uh, was the only way to settle that was to take each other to court. The main remedy under the common law was through the nuisance law and through nuisance actions. Nuisance is a common law doctrine that's grounded in the maxim that a man shall not use his property so as to harm another. Nuisance law, however, does not prevent harm. Harm must occur before the action can be taken. And in almost all nuisance cases, parties ask for injunctions. Courts are forced to make all or nothing decisions about whether a particular use should be allowed or to continue. Cases are often appeal and take considerable time, and the litigation is expensive for landowners. So an alternative to that system was sought. The cost of litigation and the inability of nuisance law to reach all questionable or incompatible land uses, much less prevent them, led communities to search for a more effective alternative. They found a model in city planning and later in county planning. <clears throat> Americans have been planning their cities since the beginning. It goes back a long way and goes back to the King of England granting authority for uh, territories to be, to be developed. Interestingly enough, legislation that established Williamsburg as the capital of that territory uh, had specific requirements for, for roads, where they were supposed to go, for houses on, on principal streets, and uh, they had regulations and rules for dwelling size and setbacks. In colonial Williamsburg, the town was divided into half-acre lots. So planning started at that time. The city of Philadelphia, when it was founded, and developed by William Penn was the first American city, large American city, to be laid on a gridiron pattern, the gridiron pattern of streets. That particular plan became popular, and the best known cities in the South that used that particular gridiron plan were Charleston and Savannah. And you all know how attractive those particular historic areas in those communities are and how well preserved they are. So, <clears throat> This was the path, pattern that planning was taken at the time. As the benefits of planning became more widely recognized, communities began to create city planning commissions to develop city plans. First official permanent city planning commission was created in 1907 in Hartford, Connecticut. And by 1913, 18 cities had established planning commissions by legislative act. The U.S. Department of Commerce in the 1920s develop model planning acts and model zoning acts under the authority established by uh, Herbert Hoover, who was Secretary of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Tennessee communities also began to make planning efforts in the 1920s. The General Assembly authorized the creation of the Memphis Planning Commission in 1921. Planning commissions were authorized in Knoxville and Chattanooga in 1922, and in Nashville in 1925. The first county planning commission was created in Shelby County by private act in 1931. The General Assembly created and passed the enabling legislation authorizing all counties and municipalities to enact zoning regulations and the Standards Planning Act in 1935. So these laws, these creations have been on the books for a good while. There's nothing particularly new about that. Today, working through our elected officials, rather than through the courts, <coughs> ensures access to affordable dispute resolution for every landowner or resident that is adversely affected by another landowner's land use choices. It also makes it possible for the community to prevent nuisances by working through its elected officials to establish the standards for land use improvements in the jurisdiction. So we went from a system of nuisance law in the courts to development of standards by local elected officials. And that's where we are today. Any comments, questions? Observations, questions, comments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Vice Chairman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill, I would think that uh, the city of Oak Ridge would be a good example of building a more modern city in the way it was laid out. Uh, streets easy to find, alphabetical, at least they were when it was created. Well, as you know, uh, Oak Ridge was developed in a hurry. Yes, sir. And it was a secret city for many years, but it was laid out based on a plan. Sounds like the Sunshine Law wasn't in effect then. <laughs> I've, I've done a little research on Oak Ridge for a previous project, and uh, it's, it's relatively interesting that they had, what is 75,000 workers there and nobody knew about it? You had to have an ID card to get into the city? Senator McNally knew about it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there you go. Yep. <coughs> yes, sir. Keith Bissell once told me that his father, when he was mayor of Oak Ridge, literally had the key to the city because the uh, gates were closed at like at 9 or 10, and if a citizen was caught outside the gates coming home, they'd have to call the mayor, find a phone, call the mayor, and the mayor would come down the gate, open the gate, and let him into the city. Um, <laughs> some would say that was progress, some would say not. I think, yes, sir. Mayor Huffman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill, let me ask you, can a municipality extend its extraterritorial planning region beyond its urban growth boundary? Uh, I think under the current law that LGPAC, again, has to approve the extension, but a planning region cannot extend beyond the urban growth boundary that has been adopted. I think that's what's in the law. I'll confirm that and get back to you. All right. Uh, if a municipality has extraterritorial planning region area, just as annexation and de-annexation are, it's reversible. Is that process reversible too? Reversible? Can a, can a municipality, after 20 years, can a different city council decide that it doesn't want extraterritorial territory and move I, back? I think they would have to go back to LGPAC and request an alteration in their regional lines. So it would and be... They also have to go through the process in the county of amending the growth plan boundaries. It, and does that affect the RPL or the NPL if you're in one or the other at all? Mm, I can't answer that question. I'll have to look at it. Right. If a county has zoning, uh, <clears throat> can a municipality extend into the extraterritorial planning region of that city the power to zone as well as subdivision regulations? Uh, I think the law says that the county has the power to zone and that municipality could not get that power. The county enforces its power. All right, well, if a county has it and a county's enforcing it, so whether a county wants to give it to the municipality or not, you're saying that's not doable? Uh, there's yes, some uh, difference of opinion in the legal community about that. And it is a legal uh, argument whether or not the county can willingly give away its power to someone else, the power to zone. Okay. Now there are there is a there are a few situations in the state where that has occurred by mutual agreement, where the county actually acted to relinquish their territory for regional planning and to grant the authority of the cities to um, to zone that territory. That has not been tested in court, and there's legal argument that says that the county can't really do that. All right. If a municipality has extraterritorial planning region and they're exercising subdivision regulations and zoning, how is that enforced through the courts? The municipal court for that particular town or city doesn't apply outside the city limits, does it? No, I don't think so. That's one of the, how do you do that? One of the arguments in, in whether or not county or city should do that. Uh, I think in the law on the Title 13, and there's a lawyer behind me that can probably answer it better than I can, uh, says that um, the district attorney for the region in which the area is located is the enforcing officer for the, for the, for the uh, area. But in your case, I think it would be the county attorney since you have zo uh, zoning authority. So it wouldn't go to municipal court, it would go to the general sessions court? I think so. Chancery? Chancery. Chancery Court. Mm -hmm. uh, just one other question, Mr. Chair. On road bonds, if there's a road bond for roads that are in extraterritorial planning regions and that road bond is, let's say, $100,000, 
the subdivision starts being developed, but as time goes by, it's not profitable. The developer pulls back on it. Years and years later, the road costs $200,000. Uh, my question is, who determines how much the road bond should be in cases where municipalities have extraterritorial planning? If the municipality has regional subdivision regulations, then the municipality determines the amount of road bond. That's one of the issues that was addressed by the, one of the bills that we covered there that would give the authority to um, enforce the standards, accept the roads, and enforce the bond to the municipality. Yeah. But as the current standard, the county would have to enforce the bond because there will be county roads. So if there's a subdivision that's in an extraterritorial planning region and a bridge in the subdivision falls in, whose responsibility would it be to fix that bridge? Be the counties. It's in a municipal planning region with municipal subdivision it's regulations. It's a county road, though. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a county bridge. Thank you. And that's one of the issues in this bill and in, in, in all planning regions, really. It's, that's, that's and Senator Henry? Thanks, sir. Now, Mr. Terry, as you know, we used to have a, a state planning commission. Did it operate in the areas which you've been describing? If it did, did it do well? Should we consider reinstating it or leave it like it is? I'll have to do a little history here. It goes back a ways. In the well, 1935... I don't want to occupy time. Well, it, I think it's fine. We've got time. The 1935... Depending. Act creating the planning laws in Tennessee also created a state planning commission. And that state planning commission operated as a, as a commission appointed by the governor to promote planning activities. And it was given certain authority for state planning. Over time, it also created a local planning initiative. And ultimately, the state planning commission had, had three sections. It had a state planning section, a local planning assistance section, and a research section. Um, I've forgotten the exact date on it, but uh, at some point in time, I think in the 1960s, the state planning commission was done away with. The uh, commission had operated as, a, as an in independent entity. It was placed under uh, the, st uh, the governor's office at one point. And you had a state pl planning office and the governor's office. The research division was still there. And then the local planning assistance section operated uh, in regional offices. Then that whole operation was moved to the Department of Economic and Community Development in another reorganization. And then in another legislative act, all of the legislation authorizing a state planning office and the research section was repealed. And state planning as a separate function was done away with completely. And this uh, came out of the fact that over time, different governors, because this agency was attached to the governor's office, used it in different ways. And so the, the, uh, the governors, kept whittling away at it and then finally did away with it. And, but that left the local planning assistance program in place in ECD. The agency that was created to replace the functionings, some of the functions of the State Planning Commission was the Local Government Planning Advisory Committee, the LGPAC. And so that's what has transpired. The LGPAC has the authority under the ECD, under the commissioner, to approve planning regions, to appoint members of regional and planning commissions, and uh, to uh, certify whether or not a, a local committee meets the requirements for a joint economic and community development board. Let me interrupt you there with a question, because Mayor McBride brought this up yesterday about the, <clears throat> the utility, if you will, of, of the LGPAC in his area. Oh, the joint economic development. Yeah. All right. Differently. I'm. I'm. All right. Then. But I'm still curious whether these are being used effectively or whether they're underutilized. Do, do, and is there any sense either from you, Bill, or any of the other members here of the commission, that there may not be sufficient understanding of the jurisdiction that they have, and it's just not really being utilized? Could we have a little discussion on that? 
it, it's this is hearsay just from talking to people in different parts of the state that in many cases the the board is not used and it's that they meet in order to meet a requirement i think in some counties that do work but it's an individual situation from county to county i think well i guess i mean if it's a benign neglect that's one if it's if it's by design if it's just the local locals decide not to do it that way that's fine i mean it's a nuisance, I guess, to the extent they meet to, to fulfill requirements and otherwise don't utilize it. But, but otherwise, I wonder if, if there's sufficient understanding of, of what they were intended to, to do and, and the good that they might do, Mayor Bragg. Well, my understanding was that there were counties and cities who would not sit down together, and so the intent was to force the issue and mm -hmm. there are counties that cooperate and there are other cities that compete and they they wouldn't talk to one another so that was the intent and that was the same thing with 1101 it was to force each county to sit down and talk to their people and figure it out and if they couldn't figure it out then they went metro government like trousdale did and that if they couldn't come up with an urban growth plan that was it so that's why you have those meetings now as, as we'll see later on in fiscal capacity when 77 percent of the fiscal capacity of the state is in 17 counties then that means that there's 78 counties that got 23 percent of the fiscal capacity and they see no reason to sit down and meet because there's no money changing hands and that's that that's I think is the issue that you're trying maybe to bring up in Carroll County when you've got thousands of acres down there that that are not under intense development activity. Mayor McBride. You know, our county has got 28,000 people and eight incorporated towns, and uh, the communication's always been good, and we all get along for the most part. I have for several years, but in most rural counties, there's not a lot of economic development going on at this this point in time and uh, there's the communication aspect of it is there but as far as just needing to come together to visit you know, there, there's no reason to we we've, we've just opened and developed a thousand acre recreational lake and a state-of-the-art shooting complex facility that opened April the 6th and when we need to get together we do but uh, to sit down and have lunch and discuss the weather is kind of irrelevant, and unless we feed them, they sure won't come. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Senator Henry. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I was listening to Mr. Terry give the background of history of this planning commission. Uh, some of you may want to do, when you get your executive committee appointed, you all may want to talk to Mr. Terry and see whether that thing had enough statewide utility to be re-examined, to be resuscitated in some proper form, or, or let it lie. So I make that suggestion to the chair. Thank you, Senator Henry. Point, I've point observed taken. before that the demise of the state planning office and the types of studies that it used to do on a statewide basis has some sort, some sort, in some ways, transferred over to Tasser. Because <coughs> the state planning office <coughs> formerly did various kinds of regional planning research, and so the only agency to do that now is here. Mm. And so that, I don't know how you want to go from that. And then one, one final comment on planning. Uh, the only agency that was remaining from the old State Planning Commission uh, was the Local Planning Assistance Office last year. And as, as all of you know, uh, that office was discontinued by the current administration. And some of those responsibilities have been picked up by the development districts, and they provide services. Any other uh, questions or comments? Yes, Senator McNally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One, uh, uh, recently some of the uh, municipalities, have, I believe, I don't know about the counties, have used the nuisance laws to combat criminal activity. And is there... Uh, impediments in that or, or is the process too long and involved for many of them to use it or is it being used fairly effectively? 
counties in enforcing nuisance laws? Municipalities mainly. I don't know whether counties uh, have used. I presume uh, this would be in in some cases where you've got some really problem areas and uh, mainly drug activity. And, uh, I think. Yeah, dr drug and related activities going on, so that the police department gets involved in shutting a business or a location down and, and gets involved in a nuisance lawsuit. Right. I think that takes time, but that's a, another legal question that I'm probably not qualified to answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you could check with your staff, I'd, uh, I'd like to know if, the, if it's a fairly simple procedure or it, it's rather complex. I know, I believe Oak Ridge has done it a time or two. I know it's been used here in Nashville to, to shut down some places that were really problem areas for various kinds of criminal activity. Thank you. All right, the action item before us is, um, is to approve the report. Proper motion would be to approve if there is such a motion. So moved. Thank you, I have been properly moved and seconded. Is there a discussion on the motion to approve the report? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed or abstaining? All right, passes unanimously. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Terry. Thank you. Okay. Yep. On our way to the uh, final report for approval, the fire service report, Ms. Corley, waiting attentively. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. It is. <laughs> Yeah, Senator Kyle's in rare form. He's Are we ready? Okay. Good morning, Mr. Is this, can you hear? You know, the, it seems like our mics project better than the mic from the podium, and I'm not sure everybody can hear as well. I don't know if there's anything we can do about that, but just speak as closely as you can, please. Okay. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Today I'll be presenting the fire service study for your approval. Um, House Joint Resolution 204 asked TASSER three things. One, how fire service is funded in rural and suburban areas, whether provided by paid or volunteer fire departments. Two, what is the effect on local governments of not having a fully funded fire department? And three, what would it mean if firefighting was made an essential service? Though the resolution was not adopted in the Senate, the Commission asked staff to continue with the study because of the importance of the study. Um, the first question raised by the resolution was easy to answer. Funding methods are clearly outlined in state law. Different types of fire departments have access to different types of funding based mainly on whether they are a city, county, or private corporation. The most notable difference between cities and counties is that counties can establish fire tax districts with differential property tax rates through fire tax districts to fund fire service, and cities cannot. There is no obvious reason not to extend this option to cities. The second and third questions are not easy because of ambiguity in the resolution's language and a lack of relevant findings in the data. Literature and discussions with uh, officials support the existence of a relationship between funding levels and fire losses, but the data available for Tennessee's fire departments did not. The quality of data for fire departments and for fire incidents is a concern itself, one that has already been identified by the State Fire Marshal's Office. The data is self-reported is, and is inconsistent and has many gaps for individual fire departments. While the limitations of the data and the absence of a statistical relationship between funding and fire losses in the data made formulating recommendations impossible, a 2011 University of Tennessee study of fire deaths by census tract provides some important policy suggestions. That study found that 90% of the census tracts in Tennessee at highest risk for fire deaths are rural tracts characterized by high poverty, low education levels, incomes and housing values, and a large number of mobile homes. 
The state fire marshal's office has already begun to target those high risk areas in an attempt to reduce fire deaths. Their efforts focus largely on methods other than fire suppression, like distributing smoke detectors and supporting public fire safety education, and on better data collection to help identify future strategies. Although the fire death rate has decreased 30% over the last 10 years, Tennessee remains among the 10 jurisdictions with the highest fire death rates nationwide. In 2009, the most recent rankings by the U.S. Fire Administration, Tennessee was seventh in the nation at 19.9 fire deaths per million residents. The national rate was 11. Tennessee's rank is comparable to neighboring states. Uh, the availability of fire service in Tennessee came to national attention in 2010 and 2011 when two homes just outside South Fulton city limits in Obion County were left to burn while firefighters were at the scene and did not act except to protect neighboring properties. At the time, the city fire department offered service to residents outside the city for an annual fee but had a controversial no pay, no spray policy. If residents outside the city limits did not pay the fee, the fire department would not provide the service. The city has since amended its fire department's policy so that it provides service to non-subscribers, but they will be uh, billed for services rendered. The first question raised by the resolution was easy to answer. Um, Current funding methods are clearly outlined in state law. Different types of fire departments have access to different types of funding. Um, the most notable difference between cities is that cities can establish fire tax districts. Um, commonly referred to as fire taxes, but they are addressed and, cl and collected as property taxes, but accounted for separately in the same manner as our earmarked property taxes for schools and roads. The resolution also asked the commission to look at collection methods in rural and suburban areas, whether staffed by paid or volunteer firefighters. While you cannot determine if the area fire department serves is urban or rural because fire departments can serve both areas, uh, the study done by the University of Tennessee uh, used census, census tracts that are clearly defined. However, we found mapping the data makes some broad conclusions possible. As shown in map three on page nine and map four on page 10, fire departments in more urban counties are more likely to be publicly funded and have mainly career firefighters. Those in more rural areas are somewhat less likely to have public funding, publicly funded fire departments and mainly volunteer firefighters. The primary revenue sources for fire service across the state are shown in map four. Um, there are two main ways fire service is funded, through taxes and through fees. Earmarked property taxes are deductible while fees are not. Some fees are specifically authorized by statutes. Others are based on contractual arrangements between property owners and fire departments. Tax revenue is typically general fund revenue, but counties may also establish fire tax districts with specific property tax earmarks. While cities cannot establish their own fire tax district, they can elect to join the counties. If you look at table one on page 11 of the, of the report, you can see the funding methods available for fire service and the statutes that establish these methods. The distribution of staff type and primary funding source by department is shown in table two on page 12. When this report was presented to the commission for review and comment in February, the commission asked staff to include more information on mutual aid and its importance. Uh, that information can be found starting on page eight. Fire incidents report show that some form of mutual aid was given in 26% of calls and aid may take any one of three forms, mutual aid, mutual assistance, or automatic aid. The first two are provided upon request for a particular incident. Mutual aid is provided at no charge. Mutual assistance occurs when a state of emergency is declared and is reimbursable. Automatic aid is given under a standing agreement to respond together to the incidents at specific locations where an unusually large number of lives would be at risk and which a single fire department would not be able to handle it on its own. 
such as the Nissan headquarters in Franklin. To answer questions two and three, we had to find out just what fully funded and essential service meant. As shared with you in a previous commission meeting, the terms in the resolution are not found in state law, nor are they defined in the resolution. Staff contacted the sponsor, as well as other fire officials, and interpreted fully funded to mean publicly funded, and essential service to mean a mandatory service. Using the limited and inconsistent data available, staff compared actual funding and resources, including mutual aid agreements to fire, death, and damage to determine whether and to what extent those resources make a difference. First staff analyzed the relationship between, per, between budget per capita and two common fire service outcome measures, property saved and deaths per million. Graphing budget per capita against property saved produces no discernible pattern, which suggests there is no relationship between the two. As, as seen um, in figure two on page 17. Further statistical analysis confirmed the lack of relationship in the data. Also, as shown in figure three, no pattern was found when budget per capita was plotted against average fire deaths per million. And statistical analysis confirms this as well. Figures two and three have also been added to this report since the February commission meeting. Additional scatter plots of staffing and training factors with fire deaths and property save have also been added to Appendix E. The final question in the resolution directed the commission to study the impact of making fire service essential. There are very few mandatory services in Tennessee and the only service with the definition of fully funded is education. It is impossible to know what level of service would be required if fire service was considered essential since it is not currently mandated, nor does the resolution offer a maximum or minimum level of service. Any legislation making fire service essential should specify the minimum level of service, which might include the following, minimum staffing levels, minimum fire station distance requirements, and minimum funding levels. Other than firefighting, there are other measures to address fire protection and reduce fire deaths, like building codes, sprinklers, smoke alarms, and public education and outreach on fire safety. All of these methods address fire protection and are underscored by the following rule. Every community should tailor its fire service to meet its needs. If you have any questions. Any questions on the fire service report? All right, the chair will entertain a motion to approve. Thank you, Mayor Beats. Properly moved and seconded, Sarah McNally and others. Any discussion? Good report, good job. Thank you very much. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? And the report is unanimously approved. Uh, tab eight is the annual report on fiscal capacity for our information only. Um, our Deputy Executive Director, Cliff Lippert, is back. And you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So next to public chapter 1101, nothing is as entertaining as fiscal capacity. Um, so that's why I'm overjoyed to be here this morning to provide you with the, the update. Uh, no, uh, actually, if you'll, if you'll turn to tab eight, we'll, we'll begin the update. I've got a little slideshow I'm going to, going to go through. What I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to, for the sake of new members and as a refresher for the rest of us, I'm going to go over some background on education funding in Tennessee and fiscal capacity briefly. Uh, and then I'm going to point you to this year's results. These are the, the, the index that was transmitted to uh, Commissioner Huffman at the Department of Education back in May. Uh, and then I'm going to highlight the effects of uh, one particular situation, the virtual academy in Union County and the effect that's, that had is, is having on education funding. So fiscal capacity is just one of the four steps used in determining uh, bas basic education program funding in Tennessee. The first step is the, the BEP funding formula itself determines the total cost for, for funding the education, the education system. And this is done using com uh, cost components. And there are three types of cost components. There are instructional costs, other classroom costs, 
and non-classroom costs. Uh, instructional costs include personnel costs for people such as teachers, principals, and uh, school librarians. Other classroom costs are components for things and in, in, in people such as textbooks, uh, substitute teachers, and school nurses. And then non-classroom costs are for components, uh, are components for things and people such as maintenance, transportation, and, um, and school secretaries. Now, for each of these types of components, there's a local share and a state share that's set by state law to divide the respons responsibility between the state and local governments for funding. For instructional costs, the, the local share is 30% and the state share is 70%. And when I say the local share is 30%, that means as a group, for all the, all the local education agencies in the state, their combined local share is 30%. Their, the actual share that each system is responsible for varies based on their fiscal capacity, and we're going to go into more on that in just a moment. For other classroom costs, the, the local share is 25%, and the state share is 75%, and the non-classroom, it's 50-50. The fiscal capacity model is used to allocate this local share among the counties and determine what, per, what portion of the combined local share each system is actually responsible for. And then the state makes up the difference between whatever this local share is and the total cost to, to fund education in that system. So what you're saying, sir, is that some local governments pay more than 30% and some pay less. Yes, sir. Do you have a list of those? Yes, sir. Those are, those are found the, well, what I have is the actual index. I don't have the, the, the actual percent they pay in the BEP. I can get that. If you would get that for me, I'd yes, appreciate sir. it. That might be interesting to look at. Yes, sir. So. How do, we, how do we arrive at that local share? Well, we use the fiscal capacity model, and, and this is based on the concept of determining how much local governments can, have to contribute to the BEP for, for each school system, and it's the idea of measuring the ability of the local governments to fund education, taking into account the, the, their, their taxable sources and their relative ability um, for the, the cost of providing the services. So it's an estimate of how much revenue per pupil each system can afford to raise for education. Now, it's important to note that this is a county level model. So we actually determine the fiscal capacity for the 95 counties in the state or the 95 county areas. There are actually 136 school systems. So in the counties where you have more than one school system, each system is going to have the same fiscal capacity. The the model I'm describing is the model developed by TASSER uh, in response to the Education Improvement Act 1992, and it's been in place, uh, used in the BEP model to allocate these funds since 1993. Since 2008, a second model developed by uh, Dr. Bill Fox at the University of Tennessee has also been used. His model is, is, a, is a tax capacity model based on uh, local um, property and sales tax bases and, and, a statewide, and statewide average rates. Um, the, when, when BEP 2.0 was, was passed, the, the, it, it brought the Fox model in, in addition to the TASSER model, and the, what the Department of Education use, does is they use a, an average of the two models to, to act, as, for the actual fiscal capacity that's used in the BEP. The intent was, and that's 50-50 average of the, of the two models, the intent was to gradually phase out the TASSER model and eventually go uh, entirely to the, to the FOX model. Uh, however, uh, for various uh, funding and other reasons, uh, we continue to use a 50-50 average, or the Department of Education continues to use a 50-50 average. So a little bit more into the, 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 the details of the, of the model itself. What we use is a, a, we use a technique called multiple regression analysis. Um, and this is a very common statistical technique uh, for understanding relationships among various factors. And so multiple regression analysis is used to describe the relationship between own source revenue per pupil, or the, the amount of money raised in each school system uh, per pupil, and then a set of other factors, which I'm going to go into here in just a minute. And what it does is it takes each variable each factor and simultaneously compares it for all counties to calculate weight. So a single weight for each factor of how much that factor contributes 
on whole to the ability to raise the revenue for education in the state. And then we multiply that weight for, uh, for each factor for each county to produce an estimate of, the, of that of that county's ability to raise revenue for the school system. So it's saying this is how much money this school system should be able to raise based on how based on their values for the different factors and on the the weight that the the model shows that 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 factor has statewide. So here are the factors that we use in calculating fiscal capacity. The first I've already mentioned is own source revenue per pupil. And we arrive at this by taking the amount of local money the school system actually reports that they spend on education and dividing it by enrollment. And when I say enrollment, I mean specifically average daily membership, the, the, the student count that the system is responsible for, as opposed to average daily attendance with the, the, the number of students who may actually show up on any given day. Uh, the next two factors are measures of the ability to raise revenue at the local level. The first of these is taxable sales per pupil, and we just take the local sales tax base and divide it by that same ADM, or average daily membership. And then equalized property assessment per pupil, which we, we take the assessed property value for the county area and divide it by ADM. Now, before we actually divide it, we um, equalize it across counties using the appraisal to sales ratio that's developed by, that's calculated by the comptroller's office. And the reason we do this is that different counties are on different appraisal cycles, and the farther you get from, from a, appraisal, the less comparable the, the figures are to more current appraisals, and this is just a way of kind of evening evening that out. Mayor Huffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Cliff, how do you handle uh, industrial properties under a payment lieu of tax agreement? <laughs> Not very well. Um, we, we have a measure in uh, in the the model called tax equivalency payments that, that, that t tries to capture these payments in lieu of taxes. It's a, a, a rather dated figure. This used to be collected by the comptroller's office and, and they discontinued collecting it, what, 19, yeah, 1995. So it's a very, very dated figure. Um, and it, um, this is something we would prefer to have a, a more current measure to, to capture this in the model. But any changes to the to the fiscal capacity model have to be uh, have to be approved through the the basic uh, education program review committee and then through the through the the uh, through the board. Uh, we've brought this to the attention of the of the review committee, but so far there's not been any changes. If you get a massive investment in a certain county, let's take Oak Ridge, for example, where you're going to have the nuclear facility there is going to have a massive federal investment, it looks like. How does that affect the fiscal capacity for that area as well as the rest of the counties? Well, any, any figure that's not in the, in the tax base but that is actually potentially affecting the, the, the ability to, ra to raise revenue could potentially distort the model. We try to capture any other uh, revenue sources through another measure I'm going to discuss here in a measure, but it, it would certainly be uh, better to, to capture those types of payments in lieu of taxes in the model. But under the Fox, under that 50% under the Fox model, when you're considering fiscal capacity, you don't consider personal income at all. Is that correct? That, that's correct. So when you're looking at the Fox formula and you're comparing Williamson County to, say, Sevier County, personal income is not considered in that. Correct, and I'm going to get at uh, the reason why we include that here in just a second, but you know, the, the, the Fox model essentially includes uh, property tax and, and sales tax. It's uh, what, what we call a, a tax capacity model, so it's the ability to raise revenue. We try to go beyond just the ability to raise revenue and, and look at the actual ability to, to pay the, those taxes and, and, and uh, taking into account the the wealth of the community and other factors. Under the TASSER model, when you're figuring the personal income, or let me ask this, do you use per capita income figures or do you use median household income? We use figures? per capita income figures. And there are strengths and weaknesses to both per capita income and median, median household. Yes, sir. Senator Henry? Thanks. I didn't understand. You said... <laughs> The ability to pay taxes is different from revenue mm -hmm. potential in the county. What did you say? That, that's that's what I said. I'll, 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 I'll maybe go ahead and go into that, uh, right. unless there's another question before. Okay. So we, if if we wanted to just measure the the tax capacity 
of, of the county area, we would, we would stop with these measures with uh, the own source revenue, the, uh, the taxable sales and the taxable or the equalized uh, property assessment. We also try to get at other factors that affect the ability to, to raise revenue. One of these is the ability to pass the, 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 that, the, uh, the tax burden on to people who don't live in the county, to, to export the tax burden. And we do this through the, equalize, the, the ratio of residential and farm property to total farm, to, I'm sorry, to total property. The idea being the more residential and farm property as a percent of the total, the less business activity is as a percent of the total. And the more business activity you have, the, the, the assumption is that the more people are coming from out of county or spending from out of county, and so they're paying part of your tax burden. So it's, it's the, the, the concept is tax exportability, passing the burden on to people who don't live in the county. Another fa important factor is per capita income. And this is the idea is that just because you have a large tax base doesn't mean the people who live in the county have an ability to pay those the taxes, the, 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 the tax base suggest that they would be able to pay. Uh, and, and for example, if, you're, if a lot of your tax base is for commercial property and your, and your residents actually have a, a, a low per capita income, they, the, it, you may have a distorted image of their ability to, to actually pay the, 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 the taxes to support the revenue that the model says you should be able to raise. So we use per capita income as a proxy for the, the ability to pay the taxes and also to try to capture other revenue. Yeah. Mayor so, Beats. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Cliff, you said something there, and, and I didn't. It took me a minute to get caught up. If I was in a county that provided jobs, or the people come into my county didn't live in my county to work and, and, and buy things, and I had a, a for one of that a, a, a financial hub. Mm -hmm. by people that didn't live in my county, mm -hmm. right? And they work there, they eat lunch there, they come in and bought stuff there. That's going to affect my county tax rolls as far as, as the BEP goes? Well, it'll show up in your tax base, uh, your in your sales tax base, and, and uh, on, on one measure, and it'll probably also affect your, your property tax base. We try, But we try to capture that ability that you're, you're exporting the, the, that through the ratio of commercial to, to total property. So it's going to show up a couple places in the model. Sales tax being one of them. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Doss. That, that's not effective, though, in a, in a, if, if the retail center happens to be in a, in a municipality because it's within a county. In other words, if you have county residents coming into a city and, and the city has the school has a school system. County has a school system. That tax exportability doesn't doesn't right. factor into the fiscal because capacity the for that county. county. Right. right, right. So since and that's one of the, the problems with using a county area model, a county model for a system that actually has, uh, a, for a state that has systems, I mean, multiple systems in counties. So you could have the case where the you have a a rich city system uh, where people are coming in from a from a poor uh, county system or vice versa uh, and shopping and, and this model wouldn't capture that because it's capturing it just for the county okay. area. So so in terms of fiscal capacity, you're all in it together, essentially. Okay, okay for Senator McNally. Oh, excuse me, Senator McNally, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since personnel costs are probably the highest in in the running of the school system, probably the biggest factor rather. Do you all look at what it, what it would take to hire, say, a, a teacher in, in one area versus another, what it takes to hire a janitor or other personnel, a cook, uh, and, and look at uh, the, the pressure on some school systems that that exist to raise raise the salary schedule up in order to hire people, um, and this happens a lot of times when there's a big industry located in, in the town. We don't address that in the fiscal capacity model, but but both the component costs for those types of positions and the geographic differences in uh, in, in hiring those people are are addressed in the in the BEP model itself. Okay. Thank you. And oh, where are we in in BEP 2.0? We lack about 300 million. Is that 
I, I'm going to have to, I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't have you. the most current figure. <laughs> yeah, maybe a Department of Education question. Was Mayor Beach, were you seeking recognition again? I'm sorry. Exactly. And Lenise. I just wanted to make one comment because I've, I've been on both sides of this and um, both sides in t as, as far as the BEP and fiscal capacity. I think there's a lot of um, confusion about the two. Um, kind of a conflation of fiscal capacity with the BEP formula itself. They really are two very separate things and this commission and this staff don't have any responsibility for the cost side of that, the BEP formula itself, and that's why Cliff would be unable to, to answer some of those kinds of questions. Um, but I just want to take this opportunity to clarify that fiscal capacity and tax capacity both are about figuring out how much money a particular area can raise. The BEP calculates how much education costs. You do those two things completely separately, and then at the tail end, after you've done, after you've completed both processes, then you use the fiscal capacity formula to determine how to spread the local share of the BEP. So you figure out that, say, the BEP costs five billion dollars. The Department of Education does that. <clears throat> The Department of Education then looks at those percentages that Cliff quoted, 30%, 25%, and 50%, multiplies them by that $5 billion by each one of those chunks that makes it up, and based on those statutory shares, they say, well, this much is what the state's going to have to pay. They go to F&A budget and they say, would you please appropriate this much money? The rest of it then becomes the responsibility of local governments. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's at the point where fiscal capacity comes in. It doesn't enter in. The, the two don't overlap at all. Um, so at that point, after the Department of Education has determined how much the local match is, then they ask TASSER for their fiscal capacity percentages. They ask UT for their fiscal capacity percentages, combine the two together, and then they look at that, say, $2 billion that the locals are responsible for, and they say, well, what percent does Shelby County have to pay? What percent does Rutherford County County have to pay and so on and so forth and split that up. For instance, let's say it is $2 billion, I'm going to take an easy one. If Shelby County's share of the total is 20% and that's where that's the range that it's been in, then Shelby County of that $2 billion is going to have to pay, help me, $400 million. Right. And then what? Then the next step for the Department of Education is to say, look back at the BEP formula and say, well, how much of that $5 billion total that the BEP cost is the cost in Shelby County. And whatever that is for Shelby County, then the state says, well, what does Shelby County have to contribute? 400 million? Mm, okay, so if they need 800 million dollars, then they say to Shelby County, well, we're, we're gonna make, we're gonna give you 400 million to go along with the 400 million that you have to raise. And that's basically how it works. They are two very separate processes. Mr. Shumpert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think this is very important. Have we looked at what the BEP says the total cost is versus what is being paid for education? My concern was always the BEP did not capture the real cost of education. Therefore, when you went to the who paid for what, you were using too low of a number to start with. And so you had to pay far more than the local share to have an educational system. Yeah, Ms. Patrick to respond and then Senator Kyle. Um, the Basic Education Program Review Committee, which is um, partly uh, determined by statute and partly appointed by the State Board of Education, looks at that every year. We're about to start that process again. I go back to the beginning of the BEP, um, where I was in f and budget at the time, and the comments that were made were that we're funding a, a Chevy, not a Cadillac. 
and based on the resources that the state has available to it. That's that's the comment that was made. Uh, everyone was was fully aware that that was going to be less than what some local governments were going to want to fund in their school system. In some cases, and it was phased in over a six-year period, in some cases the BEP called for more than they had been putting in and were capable of doing. And so they were allowed six years to do that. Senator McNally was chairing the Education Committee at the time, and many of you were involved in that process. Um, over time, the BEP formula has reached a point where it was funding a lot more of that total cost of education than it ever had before. But given limited state resources, the um, formula as a percentage of the total education funding hasn't grown a lot in the last, say, decade or so. Senator Kyle? So as what I understand you're saying is on July 1, which is like two weeks from now, Shelby County will go from having a municipal school district and a county school district to a county, unified county school district. It will not change funding capacity based upon this. That is, these numbers will not change whatsoever because of that. Correct. All right. Secondly, I would ask this commission and the staff to take a look at, you know, we have always looked at BEP as an education formula. Perhaps that will be viewed as a local government formula to fund education. And then perhaps people in local government would have a better understanding and we in the state government might have a better understanding of what, what it is. I mean, we used to, you know, Andy Womack and I used to joke that he was one of the eight people in the state who knew how to, be, knew how to calculate the BEP. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, I don't know if there's anybody in this room. I'm, I'm, there, may, there might be somebody in this room who knows how to calculate the BEP. But, um, but it, it, it does seem to me that, that, if, that, that for those who are involved in, and from the local government standpoint who have to fund the consequences of the BEP, if we had a better understanding of how that came about, we might have a better understanding as to what we ought to be, be doing in regards to the BEP to make it uh, more functional for those who have to pay. I mean, BEP sets the price tag, essentially, I think, for what, what local government's got to come up with to fund the education. It would seem to me we're letting somebody else tell us what it, what, what that is, and based upon their view of, of, of quote education, as opposed perhaps our view of funding education. Yeah. Mr. Shumpert, yes, sir. Well, I think it's been said very well that really we're talking about two totally different issues in a way. The education people are talking about how to operate X high school or Y elementary school and how many teachers. And the students don't always come in at elementary Y in groups of 25 or 20. But the cost of education will take grade one and divide it by the number and come up with the number of teachers. And so the total cost of education is one thing. And then who pays for it is another. And to me, from when it first started, I was finance in the county schools. And I think the whole thing is we have never come up with the total cost of true education. And most of us in, in local systems, a Chevrolet would have been wished uh, if we could have paid for that. And without local additional funding, it's uh, you're not going to get anywhere close to having an educational system that we say as a state that we want. Thank you. Senator Kyle. Secondly, and I don't think we take into account, we in urban communities really are having a, a balkanization of, of, of our education with the charter school issue, which may not be a big issue in your county, a rural county, but it is becoming a huge issue in, in, in education dollars following those folks out into out of the school system and into a charter school system. Matter of fact, uh, this legislature is going to do its very best to fund as many of those charter school seats as they can next year, uh, unfortunately, uh, to um, uh, which will then pull money out of that school system. But it doesn't 
change what the number of buildings you have and or, or or should it and should these formulas and formulization you know charter schools is, is very we have got a lot of people in, in, in the legislature so you all know they're very much for charter schools of course no one in their county is ever going to go to a charter school because they're they're all pretty happy with their with their local school system. We've got folks in in, in urban areas where the, where charter schools are are expanding expanding significantly because people are not satisfied with the school system and they're looking for for an alternative. I don't think when the BEP was written, I don't think when we started doing all this that we had this phenomenon of pulling people from the pulling the pulling the funding for these students out of the population and having those dollars follow them to some other place for, for the same proposition. And I, I really think as we look at how we're trying to fund that very thing, it's like these when, when, when a child leaves your school system and goes to a charter school or goes to a virtual school and that money leaves. I mean, how does that does it affect our formula? Does it not affect our formula? Have we taken that into account? I don't know, but uh, but um, and it's important for me. For instance, like the governor's proposal for five thousand charter school seats, I think thirty five hundred of them were in my Senate district. Something like that. Something like that. So it wasn't theoretical to me. Uh, it was it was actually just just right on part of our life but 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 um, uh, anyhow I'll, I'll yield back to the chair Senator Kyle mentioned in, a, in addition to uh, charter schools the virtual school issue and we're digressing here a little bit but it is a sort of a perfect segue to talk about um, the virtual school phenomenon and and what that has done in one county where the virtual school is cited with sure. the, the, the iCloud hovers over that county. Um, and so, Cliff, you may want to talk about that a little bit because it's, it's right in keeping with what Senator Kyle was talking about. And, and, I, and I, I'm going to, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's, it's going to make sense what I'm going to say about it if we get through the next couple slides okay, first. Okay, go ahead. Because it, it kind of sets the groundwork for how it's affecting. All right, thank you. The, the final factor uh, that we use in determining fiscal capacity is, is the service burden factor, which is the average daily membership divided by the population. This is included as a reflection of the spending needs in, in the county. The larger the number of public school students per 100 residents, the greater the fiscal burden for each taxpayer. So now for each of these factors, we use, uh, in, in, in calculating each of these factors, we use averages three-year averages of the data. And we do this to smooth out any large changes from year to year. Um, but even using those three-year averages, the, the factor for, for any given factor for any given county, it's going to change from year to year. And whenever there's a change in, in the factor, that change is going to have has an expected effect on the fiscal capacity of, of the county. Uh, for example, if the property tax base increases, we expect the fiscal capacity to increase. If the number of students increases, we expect the fiscal capacity to decrease. Now this, of course, is uh, each factor can be over, a change in one factor can be overshadowed by changes in other factors. So if, just because property tax base increases doesn't mean the overall fiscal capacity is going to increase. Another change uh, in one of the other factors could, could offset that. Plus, it, it's taken it relative to what's going on in the other, the other counties in the state. So just because a property tax base in, say, Stewart County increases, if that increase is not as great as the, the average of increase in the model, it may not it, it may not increase the fiscal capacity. Quickly, um, we're going to turn to Table 1 in, in page 17 of the docket book just to, uh, to elaborate a little bit on how the index itself is calculated. And again, I think this is important in setting up the, the virtual academy discussion. And, I'm sorry? No. Table one, page table one, page seventeen. Uh, lo looking uh, looking across uh, at Anderson County, what what we have uh, in this table is the the fiscal capacity variables used in in this year models, the, the values for each of these factors I've been discussing, uh, and then start uh, on the eighth column from the left, we have the actual per pupil fiscal capacity 
for, for each of the, the counties, uh, the average daily membership, total fiscal capacity, and then the index. So the, the, the factors are, are used with the weights to calculate that per pupil fiscal capacity. So for example, with Anderson County, the, the per pupil fiscal capacity that's calculated is $2,848 per student. We take that and multiply it by the, the average daily membership for the, for the county to, to arrive at the total fiscal capacity. So as shown in table one, that for, for Anderson County, that's $34 million. Now, we, take, we sum the total fiscal capacity for all, all 95 counties to get a statewide fiscal capacity, and then we divide the total fiscal capacity by that statewide amount to get the fiscal capacity index. The fiscal capacity index is what we actually report to the Department of Education, and this is what they use in combination with the FOX index to, to uh, allocate funding in the model. Starting with table two on, oh, I'm sorry, one last thing on, on table one. There is also, just for comparison, there, uh, the, very, the, the column on the far right in table one is last year's fiscal capacity index. So you can see the change for each county from last year's index to this year's index. In table two, on, start on page 20 of the tab, you see the, the, the index is going all the way back to 1996. And you'll have to you have to turn uh, a couple of pages to get all the way to 2014. That's it rolls over onto a, a second set. And then on table three, we take we've calculated, and this is on page 26, we've calculated a, an average index for for each county uh, for 15 years. And then and also an average index for the most current five years. And we, we take a ratio of the, of the most current five years to 15 to get an idea of whether um, the, the index has been trending up more recently or, or steady or trending down. And that's shown, that trend is shown both in table four on page 27 of the tab and in the, the map, uh, which is on the screen now and is also on page seven in your, in your tab. And you can see that those, those counties that are trending up uh, or steady uh, tend to cluster around the state's larger, larger metropolitan statistical areas. Yes, Here. Senator Kyle. So I can, these are wonderful numbers. There's a lot of them. Looks just like the lottery. Um, look on table two. Look at Shelby County. In 2007, we're almost, we're at 20.7% of what? Compared to Smith, uh, compared to Sullivan County, which is 2.6 percent of what? I'm sorry, you're on table two. I'm on table table two trend and fiscal capacity index. Looking oh. at page 25. 25. So what I mean, what I'm asking you is, I mean, we're, it, our fiscal capacity in Shelby County has gone from 20 percent to 17 percent, or 21 percent to 17 percent. Correct? Correct. Compared to the rest of the state. Compared to the rest of the state. Rest of the state. Rest of the state. Right. So the, the 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 total the 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 percents are always going to sum to 100 percent. So as the capacity goes up in one area, it has to go down in another area. So it's relative counties to the counties. So the total fiscal capacity, the, 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 the dollar capacity. Well, this measures essentially growth. Relative to growth elsewhere. So right. the, that's you what could, I mean. that's what right. I mean. So the, the actual fiscal capacity in, in any given county could actually be going up in dollar amounts, but as a percent of the total, it could at the same time be going down because the capacity might be going up higher in other places. But while we're on this point, and to, to focus it, as it relates to Unicoi County, and I know you're getting there, the fiscal capacity of Unicoi has been, Union, Union excuse me, has been inflated, for lack of a better term, by the virtual schools. Actually, the fiscal capacity in Union has decreased as a result. It's decreased, it's deflated, right. but that's affected the numbers. State dollars. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Thank right. you. And, let's, and this is a good time to turn to that. Okay. Unless there are other questions on the trends. And, and the reason I mention that is because it, there are components of the formula built in that are attributed to union 
that are really inapplicable. I mean, capital and things that don't apply to a virtual school um, are being booked. I'll let you describe it better. So the, the, the chairman's been referring to is the, the virtual academy in, that's been in a, operation in Union, Union County since the 2011-2012 school year. And this was authorized uh, initially with the Virtual Public Schools Act's uh, Public Chapter 1096 of 2008. This serves students in grades K through 8 from across the state. These are largely students that were not in public schools prior to their enrollment in, in the virtual academy. Uh, for fiscal capacity and funding purposes, they are treated as if they were enrolled, physically enrolled in, in Union County schools. Um, so the enrollment shown uh, for, for Union County, uh, which was uh, the enrollment in this actual virtual academy uh, was 1,679 students in 2011-2012. So Union County's enrollment increased over 1,600 students with the with the uh, creation of this virtual academy. Um, and we don't have a, a, a final figure for 2012-2013 on the enrollment, but it's estimated to be 3,200. And you can see from the bar chart that this had a, a dramatic impact on the enrollment in Union County in 2011-2012, slightly less than 3,000 students and it increased to, to over 4,500 students. Now, you'll remember from when we discussed the factors that whenever you, uh, whenever you increase the number of students, we, you, generally speaking, fiscal capacity decreases, and this is what happened in, in Union County. Uh, they had been ranked 80th in fiscal capacity in 2013, uh, and they are, as a, compared to others, they decreased to 81st in 2014. Without this increase of enrollment, they would have actually, their fiscal capacity would have actually gone up. Mr. Chairman. Senator McNally, you seek recognition. The the BEP funding then follows the student into Union County, and but there's still an obligation in the county or municipality where the student resides if at any point during the year uh, he decides not to continue with the virtual academy, he can go back to that school system. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes, Senator. So there's no... I, kn I know... In, uh, one bill that had passed the Senate regarding having the money follow students into mm -hmm. charter schools or or uh, uh, private schools, part of the money remained with the school system because uh, that base obligation, I think, still remained with them. Mm -hmm. Was there any talk of doing this when the legislation was passed for... I would have to go back and review the, the, the discussion on it. I, I'm not aware of any, uh, Senator, but it's quite possible there was. Thank you. So the, the effect on funding. Uh, these 1,600 students added to the, to, the, to the BEP increases the total cost for BEP. It doesn't matter if these students were in virtual academy, where, wherever they are, you, you add 1,600 students to the, to the state's enrollment, the BEP costs are going to increase because the costs are calculated on a per pupil basis. Well, we know that, as we've already seen, the local share is a percent of the total share, so when the total, local, when the total cost goes up, the combined local cost also goes up. Um, however, in the, in the case of, of Union County, their fiscal capacity has decreased because of this spike in enrollment. So while total, the total for locals has increased, their share of the local cost has, has decreased, uh, which me, and if their share of the local cost decreases, we know that it's, it's a, the, it always sums to 100. That means the other local governments are paying a higher share of that higher local cost than, than they would have otherwise. And that's our, our, really our only concern and the reason we're bringing this to your attention uh, is that you know, as fiscal capacity for Union County decreases, the amount for the other 95 counties responsible for increases. And we don't have, uh, we're, we're still analyzing the effect of this and, and, and this is, uh, a rough analysis using last year's figures with this year's figures. Um, what it, it looks like the 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 effect in Union County has been an increase in in state dollars of of a, 
this money coming to Union County and then going to the contractor for the virtual academy, uh, uh, most of it, not all of it, of a, approximately $8 million, while at the same time the local share that Union County is actually responsible for decreased about $35,000 because of the change in fiscal capacity. Mayor Huffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that's under the TASSER fiscal capacity. This wouldn't matter. Actually, this is not a, an artifact of the model, of, of right. our model. This would happen regardless of how you determine fiscal capacity. It's a result of the so, increase in students and that, the effect that has on total costs. and Service burden. Right. Well, yeah. it's not really a service burden issue. It's, it's the fact that the, the, the model, the BEP itself, is funded on a, on a per pupil basis. So it's the shift in students, essentially. The additional students that are in the system now, right? And and those students, the all those students showing up in that one school system. So it doesn't make any difference which fiscal capacity you use. Whether exactly. It's Fox or if, if you use still the, the, the same. The, yes, this is also just a matter of student numbers. That's correct. Yeah. Mayor Burgess, and then Mr. Dawson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Even though your fiscal capacity uh, decreases, we still have this state law on maintenance of effort. They still have to put in the same amount of local money, or at least would they not? Right, May, uh, I, and I don't think they've bumped up against the, the maintenance efforts. It, it's, I think, still close enough that... Mr. Doss? Yeah, that's a good point, though. Cliff, what you say is true, but it's not so much the change in the fiscal capacity as the fact that Union County has a low fiscal capacity vis-a-vis -vis the other districts in the state initially. And, and, and so that means they're getting more state money. Correct. Than they would if they were, if, for instance, if a Shelby County student enrolls in Union County Virtual School, uh, that student gets more state money because they're enrolled in Union County than they would if they had remained in, enrolled in Shelby County because the state the state share is less for Shelby County than for Union County and that's based on the the low fiscal capacity of Union County. The change uh, that you pointed out is true and it, it, it is is increasing, but right. Yeah. And that doesn't mean less less state money overall. It just means less state money in that one county versus another. The state pot stays the same. It just shifts. Senator Kyle, then Senator McNally, and maybe Representative Odom. That's why they chose Union County, because it was state dollars. I mean, if they, that's that's why Union County was that that was the business decision behind that. Now, I'm going to show this question to show you how little I know, I understand about this whole situation. What difference does it make? I mean, uh, the the the, the I mean, what? I mean, the whole idea is we're simply taking, if, if you lose a kid out of your school system to a virtual school, then you just lose the money. I mean, that's, that's where we are, aren't we? I mean, uh, and, and that, it, uh, and then didn't we authorize, didn't we authorize this vendor to, to, to you could say cherry pick or you could say just, uh, choose to educate kids who can't who aren't making it in your school system and then you're losing your money it's just like where i live when you put a charter school system when you put 20 charter schools and your legislators vote to do that and pull them out of my school system you're getting a taste of what we have to live with in the urban area i don't see how it makes any difference let me have miss patrick respond and then mr doss i think that's i think that's true and particularly true with respect to state dollars the state dollars do and should follow the child. Um, the effect on fiscal capacity is the point. And the point is that if the students, and it's going to be twice as many students next year, which is more than double the student population Union County had two years ago, when Union County pays less of the local share, the other counties pay more, even the counties that don't have any kids that are going to the virtual school. If no child in Rutherford County attends the virtual school, Rutherford County will still, their local share will still go up a bit, which means the state dollars they would otherwise have been entitled to will go down, and they're not even involved in the process. Uh, Philip, and then Senator uh, yeah, I just want to say that it makes a difference if, if the student moves from one fiscal capacity area area to another. In other words, yeah. that, uh, if, if they, if but if they're going from one private, well, this gentleman sits over interested. Almost every virtual school came from a student came from a private school. I don't know how he knows that, but but I guess he's he's accurate in in his in, in his statement. Then that then we weren't getting those kids anyhow. You could argue we weren't getting the funding for them anyhow. But fascinating. Now, Senator McNally, did you? 
what what was the net gain to Union County in dollars for simply acting as a conduit to allow this to happen in their county and and then the doesn't a county still they've got a base responsibility to provide it or county municipality to provide education for their students and as Mayor Shumpert mentioned that if that student enrolls in a virtual school for three or four or five months and then transfers back to the county, mm -hmm. the virtual school gets the benefit of his enrollment and the county does not. As far as the, the, the net, that's the, the figure I said that we were still analyzing is still a, a rough estimate. We're, we, we're, we have some ongoing discussions with uh, the Department of Education trying to, to, to pin that down, but it looks like uh, they, they received about $8 million in state money that they wouldn't have received otherwise, and they had a slight decrease in their, their responsibility on the local share. Um, but 96% of, the, of, the, of the, the money they receive actually goes to the contractor running the virtual academy, so it would be a much smaller amount that, that Union County itself was actually um, keeping. How, what, what's their base, base budget for education in Union I, I'll have to check that, Senator. I'm sorry. Okay. Representative Oden, did you seek recognition? You so are Kyle made most of the points that I wanted to make, but d refresh my memory uh, on the virtual academy. Did, mm -hmm. did the law require that the students be uh, be treated as being enrolled in Union County if they came from, or was that? that that's not. That's not the the law authorized a, a school district to to create a virtual academy, um, and where whoever established that virtual academy, they're treated as, as if they're enrolled in that academy. So other counties could establish their own virtual academies and they'd be treated as if they were. But that's what I'm asking. Yes. Did, did the law specifically provide for the student to be treated um, in the county where the uh, virtual academy is based? Or was that a decision made by the Department there were, of Education? There were actually two, two uh, laws passed, the, the original one authorizing the creation of the virtual academies, and that was the one in 2008. There was a second law passed in 2011 which uh, allowed for the, the contracting of the academy. I believe that's the one that addresses how they're treated for enrollment. I'll have to check that to see if it specifically says they're, they're treated as enrolled in that county. Okay, thank you. Mr. Doss, do you have a comment on that? Okay, thank you. Mayor Huffman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So that so the total BEP costs are going to go up statewide because there's students that are going to the school that were not in the public school system before. The, correct. Do you have any idea, Cliff, let's say if uh, whatever the total number of folks who are not in the school system in Tennessee right now, if 25% of the folks that are not in the school system were in the school system, what would that cost the state of Tennessee? That would be a really wild guess on my part. I would rather not do that without contacting the Department of Education. They have, the Department of Education has figures on, 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 on students that are homeschooled or enrolled in private schools, so it, you, we could yeah. arrive at, at a number for that, but I wouldn't begin to guess that at all. So all in other words, if this continues, there's a potential there that that's going to be a big number, potentially. Potentially. I think that we, we probably need to, uh, unless there's some objection in, at, at our next meeting perhaps or at an appropriate meeting in the future this year, have the Department of Education report back to us and consider whether before next session it, we'd like to solicit a recommendation uh, to TASSER of ways that this could be addressed, if at all. Um, but I, I think I, it's an issue. Um, and unless there's any objection to that, I'll ask staff to, to attend to it, both the Department of Education and to consider what recommendations, if any, we should we should consider. Okay. Thank you. Pending any other questions? <laughs> it's a virtual reality. Cliff, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, always interesting. We have been joined by Lady DeBerry. Representative Lois DeBerry is, is in the house here. Thank you. It's good to have you on board here with us at Tasser, And uh, thank you for joining us. Um, yes, Senator Kyle.
I just, as I expressed, Representative Barry for year, Representative Barry has always been hell on wheels, and now she is literally now she hell on literally. wheels. <laughs> And, and and we all just we need to watch our step. <laughs> Absolutely, looks great. Okay, we have um, we have gotten through tab eight and and are winding down here as to other business. I know Mayor Beats and I had had chatted briefly. Um, Mayor Beats, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and members, uh, for allowing me to, to take a few extra minutes here. Uh, my good friend, my new friend, Mr. Uh, Carter, on the end, brought up something at yesterday afternoon's session that uh, made me think a little bit, and, and I was really glad, and I agree with most of the statements that he said. But I would want us and our, our task or staff to realize that merely doing referendums would not solve all the annexation problems that we have in the state. We have a sister city in my county who is trying to help a business be annexed and there are no registered voters that would be allowed to vote in that particular election. So the, here we have a business that wants to be helped, a municipality that wants to help them, and no way to do it if you just say that it has to be done by referendum. And I don't know what the answer is, but those folks deserve a good look by the TASR staff a, as we go forward to, to realize that referendum just will not fix all of the issues that we're concerned with here. And I thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Chairman. Representative Carter. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And thank you for those comments. But I do want to clarify, and perhaps I was inartful in my comments yesterday, referendum would never apply to those who want to be annexed by consent. Today, they can come in by consent. There's absolutely no restriction based on the moratorium. Number one, the moratorium does restrict this because it's a commercial development. Moratorium only applies to, applies to homes and farms. Number two, remember there are four ways to annex. And one of the first is by consent. And I would never indicate that the referendum should apply to consensual annexations. I know there was a bill that was introduced that would have applied referendum even to consent. And I was not in favor of that bill. Anyone that wants to come in, I think, should come in simply by consent. And now I understand at least in, in Hamilton County and Chattanooga, we consider that a letter to the mayor asking to be taken in. And so I want to make sure that my view of referendum does not apply to consensual annexations. Yep. Yes, Mayor. But yours is not the only bills that we're looking at in, in Tasher. I think one of the bills we're looking at is the one that would prevent uh, so, so I just want us to look at, at, at all sides uh, uh, annexation is, is obviously a very tricky thing, and, and some of us have been on the county side, some of us have been on the city side, and some have been on both sides. Uh, and, and I agree with your comments uh, about 90 percent, about 1101. Uh, it, it works if if it's applied correctly, and, and everybody understands that. Well, my, I appreciate that, and I just want to make sure that my comments were understood to only apply to non-consensual. Uh, annexations is uh, is is uh, is my position. I thank you for pointing that out. I was, as usual, inartful in my comments. So thank you for that. Duly noted and and appreciated. Good discussion. Um, we do need to talk about the dates of the uh, future meetings in July, August, and October. Um, there are several options provided in July, for example, um, and and just for discussion, I'm. I'm available. I know I can, and we're, we're talking about a one-day meeting now. For those of you who were not present yesterday, at least in July, um, for these for the panel discussions um, on the dis on the discussion we've just had, July 25th is a date that had some consensus. I don't know if that if that works for you. I'm asking the body if I'm seeing heads. Not it's not good for 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 one member. <laughs> it's good. For uh, check there. That may have been one where. All right. What's it, what's that, Senator McNally? What's it? 
Now there's an idea. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't do it on the 24th. Some of us already meeting in Gatlinburg. On the 24th? Yeah. <laughs> well, what's the will of the... 25th, we talked about beginning mid-morning, whatever that means, enough time for folks to come over that, that morning if they'd like to come instead of the night before. So I don't know if, if mid-morning is 10 o'clock or 10 o'clock central. It seems to be okay, sort of. <laughs> I know, we could beam you in from Florida. That's what we'll do. And then in August, uh, here we go again. I, is August 14th or the 22nd is, is available on, on my calendar, but I'm at the will of the body. I don't know. And it may be a one day. Senator Kyle? The 14th is, is NCSL, but, but that's not your club, is it? Uh, not my club, but, uh, but it is others, and you may be going. Uh, well, the 14th. I'm just. I just wanted to point that out to the chairman that sure. that that and that. And if I just that works. If it inconveniences, I can miss a meeting. That's 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 fine. Well, these are important. These panel discussions are going to be very important. I think so. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. Um, on the just pointing out that on the 14th, 13th, and 14th, UTCIS has uh, strategic planning for economic development. Well, let me ask you this: What about the other set of dates? The 22nd. That, yes, sir. Is that better? That's clear. Yes, sir. That, oh. 21st, 22nd. Is that Wednesday and Thursday, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursday. How about just the 22nd? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right now we are. Oh, well, the, in July, definitely one day. Two draft reports uh, would be a long day. Well, it might be a two day. It might be 21st, 22nd. Kay has a conflict. Isla, do you have a conflict? Or you're open then? Yeah. Any other conflicts? Seems, seems like with each, we've got at least one member who can't, and that's, that happens. Let's. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, why don't we shoot for the 21st, 22nd, and see how that plays? It's never perfect. And then, I don't know whether it's a good idea to 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 get out into October. Uh, maybe it is. I guess somebody has to start 24th, 25th. The, the second group of dates is, is better for me, the 24th, 25th. Any objection to those dates? October. That is, well, let me see. Hang on. 23rd, 24th, correct. Okay. All right, well, that was relatively painless. Thank you. Um, we've got two sets as well there. Thank you, Kay. December 4th, 5th, and or 11th, 12th, or 11th, 12th. What do you all think about that? You get into the holiday season. Now, the, the other thing is that the staff is going to be working real hard to finish that report and make any changes. So probably the earlier in the month, the better, just as a practical standpoint. So the fourth, fourth and fifth, how about that? Wonderful. We've never had such advanced planning. Okay. Paula? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, it's 1030. Is there, do we have any other business to address? Uh, I don't see any on the agenda. Is there anything Anything further for the good of the order here today? We've covered a lot of territory. It was a great meeting. I appreciate all your active participation. In it. Mr. Chairman? And yes, sir. Uh, just to, uh, to reiterate, just to make sure we got it correct, yes, uh, we're looking in August um, 21st, 22nd, October 23rd, 24th, and December 4th and 5th as two-day events, but the only one-day event is the 25th of July. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will stand adjourned. Thank you again. I get a picture of you and Lanise. I guess what I'll break the camera.